Hey, here's a simple question with a complex answer. Where in the world do you find the most sedimentary rock? Only a small fraction of environments on Earth are actually places where sediment is deposited and becomes rock. Many environments on Earth are erosional environments. In these environments, sediment is eroded faster than it is deposited. So there is a net loss, or at least no gain, of sediment and rock. For sedimentary layers to actually pile up over time, there needs to be sediment and space for a lot of it. These things are two of the defining features of sedimentary basins. Simply put, sedimentary basins are regions where sediment accumulates over time. It's usually helpful to remember them as bowl-like depressions in the crust of our world. But this is a gross oversimplification of things. Basins come in all shapes and sizes. Some basins cover half the planet. The largest basins on Earth today are filled by the oceans. Lakes also fill basins, but they're much smaller. Some basins are just long troughs that are no more than a few kilometers wide. In any case, sedimentary basins are regions where sediment accumulates and sedimentary layers are laid down over time. For this to happen, there needs to be a large supply of sediment provided from the continent. You can think of sediment supply like sedimentation rate. Generally, this sediment comes from weathering and erosion of pre-existing rock, bringing detrital and lithogenous material to the basin, along with ions, nutrients, and other compounds dissolved in water, which can precipitate as hydrogenous or biogenous sediment. Naturally, basins can fill over time and stop being areas of deposition. Indeed, they only remain active basins as long as there are geologic processes creating and maintaining a certain amount of accommodation space. The accommodation space is the space available for potential sediment accumulation. It is the space that could be filled with sediment. As long as the amount of accommodation space is greater than the volume of sediment supply, the basin will continue to receive and accumulate sediment. In this context, if a basin is underfilled, receives a very low volume of sediment, and has a lot of accommodation space, we say that it's a sediment-starved basin. It's starved for sediment. The most important control on sediment supply is climate. The amount of precipitation, the temperature, and the presence of things like wind, waves, and currents all affect weathering and erosion of sediment. The other important controls on sediment supply are source rock and bedrock composition, as well as topography. Sediment will only make the trip from the continents to the basin if conditions are suitable for their survival and long-distance transport. The action of erosional forces like gravity, moving air, flowing water, and ice are obviously instrumental, and they're all influenced by topography. Accommodation space, in contrast, is created by very different factors. In the majority of basins, accommodation space is controlled by global changes in sea level called eustacy and tectonic processes like subsidence and uplift. If sea level rises, the amount of accommodation space increases within basins connected to the ocean. 
The opposite is also true. A fall in sea level causes accommodation space to shrink. Sea level doesn't necessarily affect basins surrounded by land, like lakes, but the water levels in these basins can similarly change over time due to changes in drainage from water from the surrounding area, aquifers, rivers, and other bodies of water. That said, the most important controls on basins are tectonic processes. They affect all basins on the continents and beneath the sea. In basins, where there is tectonic uplift and the crust is rising in place, the amount of accommodation space shrinks over time as sediment is being deposited. Subsidence, not surprisingly, has the opposite effect. Assuming a constant sediment supply, the settling and sinking of Earth's crust causes accommodation space to be created and added over time. We can summarize the relationships between accommodation space and tectonic processes, eustatic sea level change, and sedimentation rates with an equation. In this equation, the variables are all rates. T is the rate of tectonic subsidence. E is the rate of sea level change. S is the sedimentation rate, and W is the change in water depth. Negative values for T and E mean uplift and falling sea level respectively, but positive levels mean increasing accommodation space. If the sum of T and E is positive, then the amount of accommodation space is increasing over time. Given the importance of tectonic processes in controlling the addition and loss of accommodation space, it's not surprising that basins are traditionally differentiated and classified according to their tectonic settings. Some of the most straightforward basins are intracratonic sag basins. An intracratonic sag basin forms within blocks of Earth's crust called cratons surrounded by landmass. They're created by the slow subsidence of land. Because they are completely surrounded by land, you often find lakes in these basins with rivers flowing into them. In places where Earth's continental crust experiences horizontal stresses due to extension, the crust can fracture, producing structural valleys called rifts. These rift valleys in the continental crust grow over time, becoming rift basins. Some rift basins are exposed on land and disconnected from the sea. Other rift basins are located beneath the ocean where the continental crust is submerged underwater. Rift basins are often long troughs that are U or V shaped in cross section. Eventually, the continental crust may completely rupture and a divergent plate boundary will form. Basaltic magmas rise to the surface creating new oceanic crust. Thus, an ocean basin with a mid-continental ridge is created. Of course, just as the divergence of land masses can create basins, so can their convergence and collision. Indeed, the convergence of oceanic and continental crust forms multiple types of basins. In these cases, the younger, denser oceanic crust is subducted beneath the older continental crust. At this location, a basin called an ocean trench is formed where the oceanic crust sinks into the mantle. There, it melts, releasing vapors and minerals that rise to the surface as magma, creating a line of volcanoes called a volcanic arc. 
On the ocean side of these volcanoes, another basin is formed called a forearc basin. This basin is separated from the oceanic trench by an accretionary complex, which is a wedge of sediment that gets scraped off the oceanic plate as it is subducted. Nonetheless, the main source of sediment in the forearc basin is the volcanic arc. So forearc basins tend to contain a wide wealth of lithic fragments of igneous rocks. Another type of basin called a back arc basin forms on the continental crust side of the volcanic arc. It forms due to crustal extension. And like the forearc basin, its main source of sediment is the volcano chain. It may also develop material from the underlying continental crust. If conversions continues and oceanic crust is completely subducted, two bodies of continental crusts may collide, resulting in an orogeny or mountain building event, as well as the formation of a new mountain chain or orogenic belt. This collision causes one of the tectonic plates to bend and flex downward in the area adjacent to the new mountain belt that is forming. We call this basin a foreland basin. Early in its history, a foreland basin tends to accumulate sediment deposited in deep marine environments. But as the orogenic belt grows tall and matures, it begins to be weathered and eroded and starts to, to supply more sediment to the foreland basin. So from oldest to youngest, the sedimentary layers in foreland basins tend to be deep marine, shallow marine, and terrestrial facies. Hopefully now, you're beginning to appreciate how we, as geologists, can look at a sedimentary rock or sediment sample and work backward. We can work backward to figure out the type of basin a rock comes from and the tectonic setting that produced it. I want to leave you now with one final message. Sedimentary basins would not exist without plate tectonics. Without the global conveyor belt of rock and sediment that moves across the sea floor, we would not have the extensive sedimentary rock record that we study. Indeed, the Earth as a whole would look drastically different than it does today.